Hello, happy believers. Welcome to my art gallery and painting number 54. I will continue reading from the Catechism from Part 2, Section 2, Chapter 3, Article 7. I will start with a prayer. O Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten, guide, strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do and command me to do it. I promise to submit to everything that you ask of me and to accept all that you allow to happen to me. Just show me what is your will. I hope you enjoyed the audio and if you enjoy visiting my art gallery, please like, subscribe and share. I will also leave a few personal thoughts on my painting in the description below. Starting from Mixed Marriages and Disparity of Cult. In many countries, the situation of a mixed marriage, marriage between Catholic and a baptised non-Catholic, often arises. It requires particular attention on the part of couples and their pastors. A case of marriage with a disparity of cult between a Catholic and a non-baptised person requires even greater circumspection. Difference of confession between the spouses does not constitute an insurmountable obstacle for marriage. When they succeed in placing in common what they have received from their respective communities and learn from each other the way in which each lives in fidelity to Christ. But the difficulties of mixed marriages must not be underestimated. They arise from the fact that the separation of Christians has not yet been overcome. The spouses risk experiencing the tragedy of Christian disunity even in the heart of their own home. Disparity of cult can further aggravate these difficulties. Differences about faith and the very notion of marriage, but also different religious mentalities can become sources of tension in marriage, especially as regards the education of children. The temptation to religious indifference can then arise. According to the law in force in Latin Church, in the Latin Church, a mixed marriage needs for laicide, the express permission of ecclesiastical authority. In case of disparity of cult, an express dispensation from this impediment is required for the validity of the marriage. This permission or dispensation presupposes that both parties know and do not exclude the essential ends and properties of marriage, and furthermore that the Catholic party confirms the obligations which have been made known to the non-Catholic party of persevering his or her own faith and ensuring the baptism and education of the children in the Catholic Church. Through ecumenical dialogue, Christian communities in many regions have been able to put into effect a common pastoral practice for mixed marriages. Its task been able to put into effect a common pastoral practice for mixed marriages. Its task is to help such couples live out their particular situation in the light of faith, overcome the tensions between the couple's obligations to each other and toward their ecclesial communities and encourage the flowering of what is common to them in faith and respect for what separates them. In marriages with disparity of cult, the Catholic spouse has a particular task. For the unbelieving husband is consecrated through his wife and the unbelieving wife is consecrated through her husband. It is a great joy for the Christian spouse and for the church of this consecration should lead to the free conversion of the other spouse 
to the Catholic faith. Sincere married love, the humble and patient practice of the family virtues and perseverance in prayer can prepare the non-believing spouse to accept the grace of conversion. The Effects of the Sacrament of Matrimony From a valid marriage arises a bond between the spouses, which, by its very nature, is perpetual and exclusive. Furthermore, in a Christian marriage, the spouses are strengthened, as it were, consecrated for the duties and the dignity of their state by a special sacrament. The Marriage Bond The consent by which the spouses mutually give and receive one another is sealed by God himself. From there, covenant arises an institution confirmed by the divine law even in the eyes of society. The covenant between the spouses is integrated into God's covenant with men. Authentic married love is cut up into divine love. Thus the marriage bond has been established by God himself in such a way that a marriage concluded and consummated between baptised persons can never be dissolved. This bond, which results from the free human act of the spouses and their consummation of the marriage, is a reality, hence force irrevocable, and gives rise to a covenant guaranteed by God's fidelity. The Church does not have the power to contravene this disposition of divine wisdom. The Grace of the Sacrament of Matrimony By reason of their state in life and of their order, Christian spouses have their own special gifts in the people of God. This grace proper to the sacrament of matrimony, is intended to perfect the couple's love and to strengthen their indissoluble unity. By this grace, they help one another to attain holiness in the married life and in welcoming and educating their children. Christ is the source of this grace. Just as of old, God encountered his people with a covenant of love and fidelity. So our Saviour, the spouse of the Church, now encounters Christian spouses through the sacrament of matrimony. Christ dwells with them, gives them the strength to take up their crosses and to follow him, to rise again after they have fallen, to forgive one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ and to love one another with supernatural, tender and faithful love. In the joys of their love and family life, he gives them, here on earth, a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb. How can I ever express the happiness of a marriage joined by the church, strengthened by an offering, sealed by a blessing, announced by angels and ratified by the Father. How wonderful the bond between two believers. Now, one in hope, one in desire, one in discipline, one in the same service. They are both children of one father and servants of the same master, undivided in spirit and flesh, truly two in one flesh. Where the flesh is one, one also is the spirit. The goods and requirements of conjugal love. Conjugal love involves a totality in which all the elements of the person enter. Appeal of the body and instinct power of feeling and affectivity. 
aspiration of the spirit and of will. It aims at a deeply personal unity, a unity that, beyond union in one flesh, leads to forming one heart and one soul. It demands indissolubility and faithfulness in definitive mutual giving and it is open to fertility. In a word, it is a question of the normal characteristics of all natural conjugal love, but with a new significance which not only purifies and strengthens them, but raises them to the extent of making them the expression of specifically Christian values. The unity and indissolubility of marriage. The love of the spouses requires, of its very nature, the unity and indissolubility of the spouses, community of persons, which embraces their entire life, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. They are called to grow continually in their communion through day-to-day fidelity to their marriage, promise of total mutual self-giving. This human communion is confirmed, purified and completed by communion in Jesus Christ, given through the sacrament of matrimony. It is deepened by lives of the common faith and by the Eucharist received together. The unity of marriage distinctly recognised by our Lord is made clear in the equal personal dignity which must be accorded to man and wife in mutual and unreserved affection. Polygamy is contrary to conjugal love. Love which is divided and exclusive. The fidelity of conjugal love. By its very nature, conjugal love requires the inviolable fidelity of the spouses. This is the consequence of the gift of themselves which they make to each other. Love seeks to be definitive. It cannot be an arrangement until further notice. The intimate union of marriage as a mutual giving of two persons and the good of the children demand total fidelity from the spouses and require an unbreakable union between them. The deepest reason is found in the fidelity of God to his covenant, in that of Christ to his church. Through the sacrament of matrimony, the spouses are enabled to represent this fidelity and witness to it. Through the sacrament, the indissolubility of marriage receives a new and deeper meaning. It can seem difficult, even impossible, to bind oneself for life to another human being. This makes it all the more important to proclaim the good news that God loves us with a definitive and irrevocable love that married couples share in this love, that it supports and sustains them, and that, by their own faithfulness, they can be witnesses to God's faithful love. Spouses who, with God's grace, give this witness, often in very difficult conditions, deserve the gratitude and support of the ecclesial community. Yes, there are some situations in which living together becomes practically impossible for a varied of reasons. In such cases, the church permits the physical separation of the couple and their living apart. The spouses do not cease to be husband and wife before God and so are not free to contract a new union. In this difficult situation, the best solution would be, if possible, reconciliation. The Christian community is called to help these persons live out their situation in a Christian manner and in fidelity to the marriage bond, which remains indissoluble. 
Today, there are numerous Catholics in many countries who have recourse to civil divorce and contract new civil unions. Infidelity to the words of Jesus Christ, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The Church maintains that a new union cannot be recognised as valid if the first marriage was. If the divorced are remarried civilly, they find themselves in a situation that objectively contravenes God's law. Consequently, they cannot receive Eucharistic communion as long as this situation arises, as long as this situation persists. For the same reason, they cannot exercise certain ecclesial responsibilities. Reconciliation through the sacrament of penance can be granted only to those who have repented for having violated the sign of the covenant and of fidelity to Christ and who are committed to living in complete continence. Towards Christians who live in this situation and who often keep the faith and desire to bring up their children in a Christian manner, priests and the whole community must manifest an attentive solicitude so that they too do not consider themselves separated from the church, in whose life they can and must participate as baptised persons. This should be encouraged. They should be encouraged to listen to the word of God, to attend the sacrifice of the Mass, to persevere in prayer, to contribute to works of charity and to community efforts for justice, to bring up their children in the Christian faith, to cultivate the spirit and practice of penance and thus implore day by day God's grace. The openness to fertility the openness to fertility. By its very nature, the institution of marriage and married love is ordered to procreation and education of the offspring and it is in them that it finds its crowning glory. Children are the supreme gift of marriage and contribute greatly to the good of the parents themselves. God himself said, it is not good that men should be alone, and from the beginning he made them male and female, wishing to associate them in a special way, in his own creative work. God blessed men and women with the words, Be fruitful and multiply. Hence, true married love and the whole structure of family life, which results from it, Without diminishment of the other tends without diminishment of the other ends of marriage are directed to disposing the spouses to cooperate valiantly with the love of the Creator and Saviour, who through them will increase and enrich his family from day to day. The fruitfulness of conjugal love extends to the fruits of the moral, spiritual and supernatural life that parents hand on to their children by education. Parents are the principal and first educators of their children. In this sense, the fundamental task of marriage and family is to be at the service of life. Spouses to whom God has not granted children can nevertheless have a conjugal life full of meaning, in both human and Christian terms. Their marriage can radiate a fruitfulness of charity, of hospitality and of sacrifice. 
the domestic church, Christ chose to be born and grow up in the bosom of the holy family of Joseph and Mary. The church is nothing other than the family of God. From the beginning, the core of the church was often constituted by those who had become believers, together with all their households. When they were converted, they desired that the whole household should be also saved. These families who became believers were islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. In our time, in a world often alien and even hostile to faith, believing families are of primary importance as centres of living, radiant faith. For this reason, the Vatican Council, using an ancient expression, expression calls a family the Ecclesia Domestica. It is in the bosom of the family that parents are, by word and example, the first hurls of the faith with regard to their children. They should encourage them in the vocation which is proper to each child, fostering with special care any religious vocation. It is here that the father of the family, the mother, children and all members of the family exercise the priesthood of the baptised in a privileged way by the reception of the sacraments, prayer and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life and self-denial and act of charity. Thus the home is the first school of Christian life and a school for human enrichment. Here one learns endurance and the joy of work fraternal love, generous, even repeated, for forgiveness. And above all, divine worship in prayer and the offering of one's life. We must also remember the great number of single persons who, because of the particular circumstances in which they have to live, often not of their choosing, are especially close to Jesus' heart and therefore deserve the special affection and active solicitude of the church, especially of pastors. Many remain without a human family, often due to conditions of poverty. Some live their situation in the spirit of the Beatitudes, serving God and neighbour in exemplary fashion. The doors of homes the domestic churches and of the great family which is the church must be open to all of them. No one is without a family in this world. The church is a home and family for everyone, especially those who labour and are heavy burdened, who labour and are heavy laden. In brief, St. Paul said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and verse 32. The marriage covenant by which a man and a woman form with each other and intimate communion of life and love has been founded and endowed with its own special laws by the Creator. By its very nature, it is ordered to the good of the couple, as well as to the generation and education of children. Christ the Lord raised marriage between the baptised to the dignity of a sacrament. The sacrament of matrimony signifies the union of Christ and the Church. It gives spouses the grace to love each other with the love with which Christ has loved his Church. The grace of the sacrament thus perfects the human love of the spouses, strengthens their indissoluble unity 
and sanctifies them on the way to eternal, eternal life. Marriage is based on the consent of the contracting parties, that is, on their will to give themselves, each to the other, mutually and definitively, in order to live a covenant of faithful and fruitful love. Since marriage establishes the couple in a public state of life in the church, it is fitting that its celebration be public, in the framework of a liturgical celebration, before the priest or a witness authorised by the church, the witnesses and the assembly of the faithful. Unity, indissolubility and openness to fertility are essential to marriage. Polygamy is incompatible with the unity of marriage. Divorce separates what God has joined together. The refusal of fertility, the refusal of fertility turns married life away from its supreme gift, the child. The marriage of persons divorced from a living, lawful spouse contravenes the plan and law of God as thought by Christ. They are not separated from the church, but they cannot receive Eucharistic communion. They will lead Christian lives, especially by educating by educating their children in the faith. The Christian home is the place where children receive the first proclamation of the faith. For this reason, the family home is rightly called the domestic church, a community of grace and prayer, a school of human virtues and of Christian charity. That concludes my session for today. I hope you enjoyed listening and reflecting on my painting and I hope you find it as educational as I do. I will not be auditing, I will not be editing my audio. So apologies for mispronouncing some words. Some chapters are easier than others. Please like, subscribe and share so we can all live our wonderful Catholic faith in all its richness. I will now finish with a prayer. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever today be at my side to light, to guard, to rule and guide. Amen. <laughs>